possibility, ladies and gentlemen, is a force. It is a force that has transformed the world. It is exactly possibility that has allowed us to go to the moon. And it is possibility that has allowed us to seek new vistas, to find the most amazing love affairs, to invent the internet. A recent study in evolutionary biology asked the question, what is the most powerful driving force with regard to growth of the human brain, with regard to the, the, the human cortex? And what the study found was that the most powerful force is the fact that the brain has shifted from being a perceptual organ, an organ that hangs out and looks at things, to an inferential organ. We are wired for possibility. And about 20 years ago, I had an experience in my life that was destined to change my life from that point on. And today, I would like to tell you that story in the hope that your life will never be the same again. I was in a dorm room at the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa, a room that was about three times as long as my arms could stretch and about twice as wide. I had just graduated from medical school as the top student and had received a scholarship from the Medical Research Council to study neurochemistry. And despite these accolades, I felt restless. I felt that there was something, some kind of magic that I had not captured in my life, some kind of magic that I knew about from the earlier years of my life, and I wanted it back so desperately. So I started to think of how I had grown up. I started to remember that I had grown up in a pretty tough neighborhood. You know, it was the kind of neighborhood where you'd have to walk up 100 steps to get to your flat, where if you ventured down the back stairs, you would actually see gangsters making love in the dark. And if you went a little further on, you would also see the corner street boys peeling apples with their switchblade knives. If you were brave enough, you would go to the alley. And there in the alley, you would see one or two bodies drenched in blood from the prior night's indiscretions. A horror story, right? But not for me. For me, I somehow believed that I had grown up in a castle because my mother had petitioned the building supervisor to ask him to put an iron gate outside of our apartment. And when you entered that apartment, you could feel love everywhere. You could feel love wafting into your nostrils from the amazing aroma that came from my mother's apron. I felt the love coming from my father's fist as it crashed down on the table because his horse had not won the races. And I felt the love coming from the dreamy company of my brother, who sat with me for hours listening to music from the Doors, the Stones, the Beatles, the Mamas and the Papas, Dolly Parton even, Barbara Streisand and Frank Sinatra. Strange things happen when music from the West makes its way down south. <laughs> but there I was, remembering that that was the first time in my life that I had actually built these castles in the air, that I had built these castles not just in the air, but in my brain, that I knew that it was possible to reach for something and to dream up something and to have an experience of something that was different. And so now, as I sat there in my dorm room, I thought to myself, what do I really want in life? Where do I really want to be? And I thought, you know, I'd heard of Harvard and it seemed like a pretty cool place. Why not Harvard? And what do you do when you want to go to Harvard? You know, I, I work there now. Well, I thought, well, why not call up Harvard? <laughs> so I actually did. I called the operator. I got a number for, for Harvard, the main, main campus, and I said, hi, my name is Srini Pillay. Um, I'd like to speak to the head of Harvard, please. <laughs> and the person on the other side was like, um, you know, head of Harvard what? And I said, well, how about the medical school? And they said, OK, and they put me through to the dean's office. And so I call the dean's office and I say, hi, my name is Srini Pillay and I'd like to speak to the head of Harvard Medical School, please. And again, in the dean's office, they say, well, you know, this is a big school, what department would you like? And I say, how about the department of psychiatry? And so at that time, there was a head of the consolidated department of psychiatry, and that was Dr. Joseph Coyle. And on that day, he happened to be passing by his desk because his secretary was in the bathroom. And so, he picked up the phone and said hello, and I said, hi, my name is Srini Pillay. Um, I'm just sitting here in this dorm room in South Africa, and I'm thinking, boy, wouldn't it be great to go to Harvard? 
And you know, he told me later he thought I was crazy. He, he, he said, well, you know, I, but I, you know, I had to be decent. So I said, well, you know, that, that's very nice. You know, a lot of people are very enthusiastic about going to Harvard. Why don't you send me your CV and send me a letter and we'll see what happens. And so I did that. And then a few weeks later, I get a call from Dr. Jonathan Cole, who's the father of psychopharmacology. And Dr. Cole interviews me on the telephone. And a week from then, I'm walking over to my dorm room, and I see a FedEx envelope outside. And my heart starts to race. And I start to say, I wonder if this is from Harvard. And so I open it up, and I take the piece of paper out, and I look at it. And right in front of me, I see the Harvard insignia and that famous Veritas sign saying, congratulations. I mean, I literally could not believe my eyes. Here I was, having this completely zany idea that I would simply call up Harvard and talk to the head to see how I could get in. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in South Africa in this really tiny dorm room, and I'm off to Harvard. Now, you know, when I, when I thought about telling you the story, I thought, well, what is the real purpose of the story? And the real purpose of the story is that every one of you has some kind of ineffable goal that you're reaching for that you've not actually dared to take the first step towards. And if we look in the brain, what we will see is that the brain has a GPS right on top and to the side, which is the posterior parietal cortex. And in order to direct you toward your goal, neural tissue actually has the ability, if you punch in information into it, to take you to your goal. And a lot of this information is not conscious, it's actually unconscious. It's those horrible feelings. You know, it's those feelings of, I hate my life right now, what am I gonna do? I, do? I feel scared, I feel disgusted, I feel afraid. It's exactly those feelings that make you feel really afraid. And what studies have shown is that long-term memory, remembering where you came from, remembering what you've done, can also connect you with this GPS system. But a lot of times, when we're at point A and we want to get to point B, we give up. Because along the way, we find those foggy nights. We find those nights when we say, you know what, I give up. I can't do this anymore. I really can't. It's a ridiculous idea. Who's going to pick up a phone and call Harvard? That's ridiculous. What are you going to do in your life in relation to your goal that's going to stop you all of a sudden? And what, it, and what is this foggy night in your life, and how do you get beyond this? Well, another study showed that when you are there on this foggy night, when you are sitting there saying to yourself, I don't know that I can see anything in front of me. The thing to do is not to look at external stimuli. The thing to do is to connect with intention. Because what this study showed is that if you connect with your intention when you are lost, you will actually be able to more accurately remember previous actions and their consequences. And when you do that, it's much more powerful than connecting simply with what's going on on the outside. And when all else fails, ladies and gentlemen, and I say this to you and everyone in the world, when all else fails, imagine. Because imagination is not just the fodder for fools. Imagination feeds the GPS system in the brain. And when it does, it also activates the action center in the brain. And so if we remember these four principles, when we're trying to go from point A to point B, the fact that this is not just magic, the fact that your brain will often move you toward your goal long before you know it. We call this preemptive perception. That when you're having these feelings that are very uncomfortable, you don't actually have to plaster your face with a smile. You can actually admit these feelings to your life because distressing emotions are okay. And when you are on this path to go from where you are to where you want to be, if you are lost, look inside. And when all else fails, imagine. Because imagination is an extremely powerful force that actually activates the action center in the brain. Now, what I neglected to say was after I got this great news, I, I called up my family and I said, guess what? I got into Harvard. And they said, well, why didn't you tell us? It would have been so amazing if you told us. And I said, because if I told you, you would have told me that that was impossible. And I now know that that would have slapped down my GPS system and not allowed me to get to where I wanted to get to. It does not matter whether you are driving a tractor or a Ferrari. The most important GPS in your life is in your brain. And I'd like to end with a quote from Richard Bach, which I think speaks to this, which is that the mark of your ignorance is the depth of your belief in injustice and tragedy. 
what the caterpillar calls the end of the world, the master calls the butterfly. Thank you.